Page 48. Aeolus and Circe. Odysseus had no idea how much grief and suffering would come from his careless boast to Polyphemus. He and his men traveled on across the uncharted sea, congratulating themselves on their escape. They were still lost, but they let the wind carry them forward, hoping that they would soon reach land. It was a long time before the wind dropped. When it did, they saw an astonishing sight ahead of them. They were close to an island, completely unlike any they had ever seen before. Its sides were tall cliffs, rising vertically out of the water. On top of the cliffs was an unbroken wall of bronze, running right around the island. The sailors stared up at it in, in, in astonishment. And as they stared, they realized something even more amazing. The island was floating. It moved and shifted constantly on the surface of the water. Every gust of wind set it circling first one way and then another, drifting like a piece of thistledown. The sailors muttered nervously to one another, wondering what kind of people might live on such an island. But Odysseus didn't hesitate. He stood at the prow of his ship and shouted up at the wall, I am Odysseus, king of Ithaca. My companions and I are on our way home from Troy. Are we welcome here? From behind the wall of bronze, a great voice boomed back at him. You are welcome, Odysseus of Ithaca. Your ships have reached the home of Aeolus, lord of the winds. He invites you all to land here and refresh yourselves. Rope ladders came snaking down from the top of the bronze wall, ready to be climbed. Immediately, Odysseus gave orders for all his ships to anchor. Lowering the boats, he and his men rowed over to the island and began to climb. Aeolus was waiting for them inside the bronze wall. Welcome to my home, he said. My wife and I live here with our six sons and their wives, who are also our daughters. We have everything we need on this beautiful island. Inside his magnificent palace, a feast was already being prepared. He invited the visitors to share it, asking nothing in return except the story of their adventures. The feast went on for a whole month. Aeolus listened eagerly to everything that Odysseus told him. He was full of questions, and Odysseus was happy to spend time answering them. His men needed a chance to relax and build up their strength. But a month was enough. After that, Odysseus took Aeolus aside. We must continue our journey, he said. Will you help my ships on their way home to Ithaca? With pleasure, said, o said Aeolus. I'll give you all the food and water you need and a much greater gift as well. He took out a huge leather bag made of a whole ox skin and held it up for Odysseus to see. Zeus has given me power over all the winds in the world, he said. I will protect your ships and make sure that you have the right wind to blow you straight home. Opening the bag, he filled it with all the fierce and dangerous winds that would have blown Odysseus off course and wrecked his ships. The bag swelled up and he tied the top tightly with a silver wire. Then he stowed it in Odysseus's ship. Keep this safe until you reach your own island, he told Odysseus privately. Don't open it, not even a crack, until you and all your men have landed there. Only one wind had been left out of the bag, the gentle west wind that would take the ships home to Ithaca. Odysseus and his men set sail at once. It was the easiest vo voyage any of them had ever made. For nine days they sailed smoothly over a gentle sea, with blue sky above them and little waves lapping the sides of the ship. Odysseus was determined not to let anything go wrong this time. He insisted on steering his own ship all the way, without resting or sleeping. 
On the tenth day, as the sun rose, they saw the rocky shape of Ithaca ahead of them on the horizon. Soon they were close enough to make out the glimmer of fires on the shore. They started to look forward to kissing their wives and hugging their children before the day was over. But Odysseus was exhausted. He hadn't slept at all for nine days and nights. By the time the coast of Ithaca appeared, he was so tired that he couldn't keep his eyes open. Sinking down onto the deck, he fell fast asleep where he was, right beside the bulging oxhide bag that Aeolus had given him. For nine days the sailors had been looking at the bag and wondering what was inside. Now they began to whisper about it. It is a great treasure, said one, and Odysseus means to keep it all for himself. It's not fair, said another. We've been his companions all this way, and what have we got to give our wives? Nothing! The rest of them began to grumble, too. He should share it with us. We've all suffered together. Why should he grab everything? Let's take a look in the bag. Without waking Odysseus, they hauled the huge swollen skin out of its hiding place. They untwisted the wire that tied it shut and opened the neck of the bag. And all the wild winds in the world came raging out around them, Tornadoes and tempests tore into their sails. Gales and hurricanes drove the ships backward, flinging the sailors headlong onto the deck. They clung desperately to ropes and spars to stop themselves from being swept overboard, watching in despair as the coast of Ithaca disappeared over the horizon. In the middle of this whirling storm, Odysseus woke up. Immediately he guessed what had happened, and all of his hopes of seeing Penelope and Telemachus were ripped away. He was on the verge of throwing himself overboard. What was the point of struggling on? Why not just give up and drown? The temptation was strong, but his longing for Ithaca was even stronger. He curled into a ball, pulling his cloak right over his head. Closing his, his eyes, he set himself to endure the storm and the bitter disappointment. After a long time, the winds blew themselves out and the waves died down. Lifting his head, Odysseus realized where they were. They had been blown all the way back to the floating island of Aeolus. Maybe that was a, good, a piece of good luck. Would Aeolus help them again? For a second time, Odysseus called up at the bronze wall above the cliffs. But Aeolus was not welcoming this time. When he heard what had happened, he reacted with cold fury. Get away from my island, he shouted. The gods obviously detest you. I'm not going to help a man they hate. Go away and never come back. Odysseus and his men hoisted their sails, swamped by despair. What fate was in store for them now? Would they ever see their homes again? Back on Ithaca, Penelope was de desperate for news. She questioned every traveler who arrived on the island, but no one could tell her anything about Odysseus. All she could do was go on waiting faithfully. While she waited, Telemachus was growing up. She talked to him constantly about his father, telling him what a clever, good man Odysseus was. One day you'll see that for yourself, she said. One day he'll come back. Other people weren't so sure. Men were beginning to look at Penelope and see how beautiful she was. It's a waste, they muttered to one another, a waste for a woman like that to wither away on her own. She should choose another husband. Far away from Ithaca, Odysseus and his men sailed on across the unknown empty sea. As they sailed, they noticed the nights growing shorter and the days growing longer and longer and longer. Finally, they reached a land where there was no night at all. Sunrise followed straight after sunset. As soon as the evening light started to fade, dawn stretched her rosy fingers across the sky, turning it pink, and up came the sun again, not leaving any time for rest and sleep. They had come to the land of the Lagastronians. If Odysseus had known what kind of people lived here, he would have ordered his sailors to row as hard as they could. He would have sent his ships racing away from shore. But he didn't know. All he saw was a safe harbor, out of reach of the sea. 
It was formed by two long headlands curving around toward each other until they almost met. Their steep cliffs enclosed a circle of calm water, large enough for all twelve of Odysseus' ships to anchor side by side. Eleven of the ships sailed straight through the narrow gap between the headlands into the calm waters of the harbor. But something held Odysseus back. He didn't understand why he was reluctant to follow the other ships, but he obeyed his instinct. Staying outside the harbor, he moored his ship to a rock at the end of one of the headlands. Then he clambered ashore and climbed up the hill to take a look inland. There were no buildings in sight, no fields, no houses, no cattle. The only sign of any inhabitants was a single wisp of smoke. He called three men ashore to join him. Go and look for food and fresh water, he said, and find out if there's any people living here. The men set off at once, following a broad track that ran down from the hills. They hadn't gone far before they reached a spring of water. A large, strong girl was kneeling beside the spring, filling a jar. They greeted her politely and asked her where they were. You are in the land of my father, King Antiphates, she said. He lives down there. She stood up eagerly, pointing out her father's palace. They were startled by how big she was. She towered over all three of them, but she seemed friendly enough, so they went on toward the palace. It was a large, high building at the bottom of the hill, with a small town clustered around it. When they entered the palace courtyard, Antiphates' wife came out to meet them. When the sailors saw her, they were terrified. She was a mountainous woman with arms like tree trunks and hands as big as hams, but it was too late to escape. She called Antiphates, and he came charging out of the palace, licking his lips. He snatched up one of the sailors in a huge fist and grinned horribly. Supper, he said. The other two sailors ran for all they were worth, heading back toward the harbor. Antiphates ran after them, calling the rest of the Lostragonians to join him. Watching from his ship at the end of the headland, Odysseus saw the two men reappear, running for their lives. Close behind them came a crowd of giant Lostragonians howling with excitement. Before Odysseus had time to react, the Lostragonians were standing on top of the cliffs, hurling huge rocks down into the water. The eleven ships in the harbor splintered into pieces. Groaning and screaming, the injured sailors were thrown into the sea. At once the Lostragonians slithered down the cliffs and waded into the water. They began to spear the drowning men as though they were fish. There was no way of stopping the slaughter. All Odysseus could do was look after the men on his own ship. He drew his sword and sliced through the mooring rope, yelling at the top of his voice, Row! Row for your lives! Sobbing with grief and shock, the sailors pulled away from that hateful shore. The terrible screams of their comrades echoed in their ears. They did not stop rowing for a second until the land of the Lostragonians had disappeared and they were out in the wide, clean sea. They had saved their own lives, but the other ships were lost with all their crews. Odysseus had left Troy with twelve ships full of heroes heading back to Ithaca. Now there was only one ship left, and its sailors were weary and desperate and far from home. The long ship limped across the sea, going where the current took it. The sailors were too shaken to care where they went. When they reached land at last, there was none of the usual cheering or celebration. The ship slid silently into harbor as if it had a crew of ghosts. The anchor dropped so slowly that the water around it barely rippled. When the sailors went ashore, they just lay on the beach for two days, so exhausted they couldn't move. On the third day, Odysseus took his sword and spear and went off to explore. Scrambling up a hill, he saw that they were on a low wooden island, thickly covered with trees and oak scrub. The only open space was a clearing in the middle distance. Most of it was hidden behind tall trees, but he could see curls of reddish smoke between the branches. Obviously, someone lived here. He went back to the beach to collect his companions. We need to find people who can tell us where we are, he said. I've seen some smoke. 
Until he mentioned the smoke, the sailors had been numb with shock. Now they remembered the last wisps of smoke he'd spotted, and they began to relive the horrors they had seen in the land of the Lostragonians. Men who had faced battles without flinching started to sob and wail, grieving for their dead comrades. We can't stay here, they cried, or we'll meet more monsters. How can we go? said Odysseus. We're completely lost. We have to find someone to tell us the way to Ithaca. Otherwise, we'll die without reaching home. The men went on wailing and protesting, but Odysseus wouldn't listen. He divided them into two groups, one led by himself and one led by his mate, Eurylochus. They drew lots to decide which group should go inland to explore, and Eurylochus's group was chosen. Still weeping, they set off into the forest, and Odysseus and the others settled down to wait for them. There was no path in the clearing, so Eurylochus and his men had to cut their way through tangled undergrowth. Every time they heard a noise, Eurylochus insisted on stopping to look around. It was a long, slow journey. Finally, they saw the open space ahead of them through the trees. They cut their way to the edge of the space and found themselves gazing at a fine stone house built in a very center of a clearing. There was no one in sight. Cautiously, they took a step forward out of the trees. At once, dark shapes raced out from behind the building. The sailors found themselves looking into open mouths with long, gleaming teeth. Wolves and lions! There was no time to run away. The men froze with fear, expecting to be torn to pieces by cruel fangs. Instead, the animals came crowding around them, nuzzling at their legs and licking their hands like tame dogs. Feeling as though they were in a dream, the sailors moved forward across the clearing. Then they heard someone singing. From inside the house came the clack of a shuttle and the sound of a woman's voice, the most beautiful voice they had ever heard. Be careful, murmured Eurylochus under his breath. No one listened to him. All the other men were mesmerized by the singing. Is it a woman or a goddess? asked Polylates. He lifted his hand and called toward the house. We are travelers who need help. Can you tell us where we are? There was a pause. Then out of the house came a woman with long flowing hair. She stood in the doorway and smiled at the staring sailors. Welcome, she said. I am Circe. I have seen that your journey has been long and exhausting. Come into my palace and eat with me and rest. Her hair was like music and the sunlight glinted in her hair. Be careful, Eurylochus muttered, very careful. The others didn't even hear him. They were already walking into their house with their eyes on Circe's face, looking forward to the feast she had promised. Eurylochus hesitated for a second. Then he stepped back into the shelter of the trees. Fixing his eyes on the house, he waited to see if his companions would return. Circe pre prepared a wonderful dish of cheese and barley meal and golded Pramnian wine. While it cooked, the sailors closed their eyes and breathed in the wonderful honey scent. They didn't see the drug that Circe dropped into the pot. When the barley meal was ready, she heaped it into bowls and set it on the long table in her banquet hall. Eat, she said, and be refreshed. It was delicious. The sailors ate it greedily, finishing every mouthful. As they ate, their memories of Ithaca faded away. They forgot their homes and their families. All they thought about was spooning the food into their mouths faster and faster and faster. Nothing else mattered. Guzzling down the barley meal, they changed from valiant men into pigs, shouted Circe fiercely. Her voice was not soft and welcoming now. She was holding a stick and she beat them until they ran away from the table and out the back door of the house. You are pigs, not men, she called after them. Get off to the sty where you belong. When they were in the pigsty, she bolted the door and flung in handfuls of coarse, dry acorns for them to eat. They grunted wretchedly and snuffled in the straw with their damp, ugly snouts. Though they had the bodies of pigs, 
Their minds were still human. They wept as they ate the acorns. Odysseus and his group of sailors knew nothing about all this until Eurylochus came running out of the forest. When they saw him, they were horrified. He was shaking all over and sobbing so hard that he couldn't speak, and he was on his own. What happened to the others? Odysseus said quickly. Are they dead? Eurylochus couldn't speak. He just shuddered and covered his face with his hands. They sat him beside the fire and wrapped a cloak around his shoulder, and at last he calmed down enough to start talking. He described the house and the clearing and the beautiful singing. I warned them to be careful, he said, but when Circe invited them in, they didn't listen to me. They all followed her, and that is the last time I saw them. Odysseus frowned. Didn't you look for them? Yes, I did, Eurylochus said miserably. After a long time, I crept over to the house and peered inside. The banquet hall was deserted, and the chairs were tumbled to the floor. Circe must have killed them all. Let's get away from here. Not until we know what happened to our comrades, Odysseus said firmly. Show me the way to Circe's house. Eurylochus fell to his knees. Please don't force me back to that terrible place. We can't rescue the others. We must think of ourselves and sail away from here. Odysseus saw how distressed he was. Stay here with the other men, he said. They'll take care of you. I'm going to Circe's house to find out what she's done to our companions. That's my duty. Leaving Eurylochus with the rest of the crew, he set off on his own down the newly made path. He almost reached Circe's palace when suddenly out of nowhere a young man appeared on the path in front of him. Where are you going? he said to Odysseus. Are you off to Circe's house to rescue your poor sailors from her pigsty? Odysseus stared at him. The young man smiled. You'll find yourself in the pigsty too, he said, unless you accept my protection. He reached out his hand, and Odysseus saw that he was holding a strange plant with a black root and a flower as white as milk. It was moly. No human being would have dared to dig up such a dangerous plant. Staring down at it, Odysseus knew that the young man in front of him was no mortal. He was Hermes, the giant killer and messenger of the gods. Odysseus bowed his head and listened carefully to the gods' instructions. Circe will make you a drugged meal, Hermes said, but this plant will rob the drug of its power and protect you from her evil spells. Eat what she gives you and wait until she strikes you with her wand. Then draw your sword and threaten to kill her, and she will obey your orders. He dropped the plant into Odysseus's hand and disappeared. Slipping a leaf of moly under his tongue, Odysseus continued down the path. Circe's magic glade was only a little way further on. He strode into it, calling out boldly, Who's there? Is there any welcome for a weary traveler? Circe came through the polished doors of her house and looked at him across the clearing. Raising one white hand, she beckoned to him. Warily, Odysseus followed her into the house. She waved him toward a beautiful, silver-studded chair and pulled up a stool for his feet. Rest there, she said sweetly. You must be tired after your journey. Let me prepare a drink to revive you. She went out and came back with a golden bowl in her hands. Odysseus put it to his lips, and she watched until he drunk it all to the last drop. Then she lifted her stick and hit him on the shoulder. Be off to the pigsty with your friends, she said scornfully. But Odysseus didn't change his shape as she had expected. He still had the moly leaf under his tongue. Jumping up, he drew his sword and charged at her as though he meant to kill her. Circe shrieked and flung herself onto her knees. Who are you? How could you drink my drug without being affected? She clasped Odysseus's feet and burst into tears. In her terror, she was prepared to do anything to save her life. Do you think I'm beautiful? If you spare my life, I will be your lover, and you will find me faithful and true. Put your sword down and be gentle. How can I be gentle when my friends are in a pigsty? Odysseus said curtly. I won't put my sword away until you swear by all the gods not to harm anyone else. Circe swore it solemnly. Then she ordered her maids to prepare a feast, but Odysseus refused to eat. 
How can I feast until my men are free? If you really want to win my heart, bring them here and undo your spell. Circe didn't hesitate. She went straight to the pigsty and unlocked the door. With her stick in her hand, she drove the pigs into the banquet hall. Then she smeared each of them with a magic ointment. One by one, as she rubbed it over their bristly skins, they changed back into men, Odysseus knew. Their memories came back as well. As they recognized Odysseus, they began to weep tears of such happiness that even Circe's heart was touched. Noble Odysseus, she said, bring the rest of your sailor's heel, and I will prepare a feast for you all. Then I will tell you how to find your way home. You can trust me. Remember what I have sworn. Odysseus knew that she would not dare to break that oath. So he went back to the shore and led the rest of the sailors to Circe's palace. Even Eurylochus was persuaded to forget his fear and join them. Circe prepared such a magnificent feast that they stayed in her house for a whole year, recovering from their grief and exhaustion. They spent all the winter there. But when the long summer days came back, the sailors took Odysseus aside. It's time to go home, they said. Odysseus knew they were right. At the end of that day's feasting, he went to Circe and reminded her of her promise to help them. We want to leave at once, he said. Which is the way to Ithaca? It's not enough to know the right direction, Circe said gravely. Before you sail, you must consult the soul of Therasius, the prophet in the land of the dead. The land of the dead? Odysseus was appalled. No one has ever sailed there. How can a ship reach such a place? Just set your sail and let the north wind take you, said Circe. You must do it, Odysseus, or you will never reach home. Odysseus was terrified at the thought of facing the dead, but he knew he would do it as she said, if that was the only way to get back to Ithaca. <laughs>